million that marked the living God. And by faith he stood in power, and that giant had to fall. The Israelite people rivaled by a wall. But when the people shouted that wall, it had to fall. There is a sound. Release the sound. Release the sound. Release the sound. 
right now. Lift up the name of Jesus. Jesus, we praise you this morning. That's it. Let's give God praise right now. Jesus, you're worthy. Jesus, you're worthy. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Call upon that name. Call upon him today. Lift up your voice and call upon the name of the Lord. He is able, he is able, he is able. Hallelujah, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The psalmist said it often. He said, I will call upon the Lord. I will call upon him. Why? He said, I know he's got his ear in tune. His ear is inclined unto my voice. Church, when we lift up the name of Jesus, we have the attention of the one who the word says inhabits the praises of Israel. That's why we want to lift up Jesus. We don't just go through the motions. It's not just tradition. We know that there is power in lifting up the name of Jesus. There's power when we worship. There's power when we praise. There's power when we lift up the wonderful saving name of the Lord Jesus. Whatever you have need of today, if you can get his attention, I'm here to declare this morning anything is possible. You may have a mountain of impossibilities, but we've got a name that is above every name. If you believe that this morning, would you praise God, give him an offering of praise, a shout. Hallelujah. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. How wonderful it is to be in the house of the Lord this morning. We're going to do exactly what the Bible says in Colossians 3 and 17. And whatsoever ye do in word, or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Everything we do today, we do it all in that name, the name of Jesus. Church, are you thankful for Jesus today? It is so good this morning to have with us. He's been out for a little bit, but Brother Abe Welch is back with us this morning. We bless you, Brother Abe. We love you. We're so thankful that you're able to be back in service with us. It is so good to see you back there. Why don't you take a moment and greet a few people near you? Why don't you bless them this morning? Let them know it's good to see them as well in the house of the Lord, worshiping magnifying the Lord. Praise the Lord. Ushers, you can make your way on down. It is so wonderful to be here this morning. If you're a guest with us, we welcome you to First Pentecostal Church. Thank you so much for being here today. We bless you in Jesus' name. Let's give our guest a First Pentecostal Church welcome. Thank you so much for being with us in person or online. We bless you this morning. Thank you so much for being with us. If you are a first-time guest, please, if you're able to, stop by our welcome center in the foyer. We want to take a moment and connect with you. So please, if you're able to do that, please stop by right after service for a first-time guest with us. We'd like to invite those of you that are new to the First Pentecostal Church family. Uh, our last new member lunch was in August of 2022. And my, the, the days, the weeks, the months go by pretty quickly, it seems. But if you are new to First Pentecostal Church since August of 2022, we'd like for you to be a part of our new member lunch that's going to happen following the August 13th 
Sunday morning service. So all you need to do is just RSVP. You can do that at the information desk in the foyer. And if you are a new member and missed your August lunch, you're welcome to take part in this new member luncheon as well. So please just sign up. Let us know how many in your family will be attending. It'll give you time to meet with pastor and the staff and find out about all the ministries and, and, and all the activities and things that you could also get involved in within this church. And it'll be a great time to meet and greet as well for that new member lunch. So we're going to give to the Lord this morning, so we invite everyone to give. It is a good thing to give, and the Bible says the Lord loveth what kind of giver? And we're a cheerful giving church. We love to give and bless the work of God, so that's what we're going to do. But we're also going to pray at this time, not only that the Lord would bless our, our time of giving, but also there are those that have need. We're going to bring those needs to the Lord. So let's lift our hands in faith right now, believing that those who need a healing touch, those that, that need God's miraculous working power that God would minister, we have confidence in Him and in His Word. Our faith is in His Word. Jesus, today we believe that you're still able to heal and deliver. We pray that you administer to every one of these needs, oh God, that are before us, uh, every need that's in this place. We declare, Lord, that you're able to heal and lift up and deliver and save. We know that you are able. We pray that you would move uh, on behalf of each and every one of these prayers. Uh, we believe, Lord God, that you're able. We place our faith in you right now. Bless, Lord God, this offering we're about to receive and Lord more than anything else today we pray may the will of the Lord be done in us and through us uh, that your name will be glorified and lifted up uh, in this hour in Jesus name we pray church let's give the Lord another offering of praise Jesus is worthy to be praised
Lift up the wonderful name of Jesus and give him praise for every miracle he has ever done in your life, for every blessing he has ever provided for you, for every time he has guided you in the darkness and led you through your crisis and your adversity. How many of you have overcome the storm and know that God is with you there to reveal himself to us, to lead us? He said he would never leave us nor forsake us, and I believe that truth is indeed the truth that we've all experienced, and what a, re what a blessing it is to know that Jesus is with us. Is anybody glad Jesus is with you today? He said he would never leave us nor forsake us, and I believe that truth. Well, it's always a joy to baptize wonderful people in the wonderful name of Jesus, Brother Wiley. Lowry, where art thou, Wiley? Come up here and receive this certificate. There he is, baptized in the wonderful name of Jesus. Wiley, we love you, appreciate you. It's great to have you at the First Pentecostal Church. Now remember, we always begin every fall and then also every spring, we begin our college courses with Purpose Institute. Purpose Institute is a way for you to gain a theological degree. You can get an associate's and a bachelor's degree, and we only meet eight months out of the year, but it's only one week per month. So you only meet four times, and you come to Friday night and Saturday. I know it's reading and it's writing, and many of you are in school, and it, you're under a lot of pressure, but I really recommend that if you want to learn how to study God's Word at a deeper college level, you need to participate in Purpose Institute. It will benefit you tremendously. This, this semester, we've got four great speakers lined up for you. Brother Brown's going to be speaking in August. We've got Brother Myron Weidman, Wild Man Weidman coming from Atlanta. You don't want to miss him for sure. And then we have Brother Jonathan Haygood 
who's going to be with us, and we also have Brother Jeffrey Ralston that's going to be with us. And we're going to have a great time learning the Word of God together, and these men have some tremendous insights to share with us. And yes, you got to write and take notes and then do a paper on it, because I make you do all of that stuff there. And I know the other teachers on Saturday have their own things that you've got to do, and it's really a, a great time of learning and, and you want to participate in it. How many of you want to learn the Word of God? And if you can, it's $400 per semester. We also have scholarships. If you can't afford it, then apply for the scholarship. And we'll see what we can do to help you out to accomplish this. And I know that it will be a tremendous blessing for all of you that will participate. Amen. Aren't you glad that when God set up the church and wanted to transfer his nature into the body of Christ to give us our identity of who we are supposed to be and what we are supposed to be doing, he magnificently shows us in the word of God. He gives us practical application. He gives us doctrinal statements and spiritual experiences to solidify that and make it real. And so we understand, those of us who have been in church for any length of time, we know that the law was given to Israel on Sinai to bring them to Messiah. We understand that. We know that that is a theological truth and fact. But this church exists for one reason. And that is to bring people to Jesus Christ. To bring people to the Lord Jesus. That's the reason why all this beautiful singing that was up here, wasn't it magnificent? It wasn't for your entertainment. It was to bring you to Jesus. The reason I'm going to preach today is not just simply so you'll say, oh, I really enjoyed that message And that don't mean beans in an American society any longer. Oh, you enjoyed yourself. And I want you to enjoy yourself today. I don't want you to have a bad experience. I want you to come to church and enjoy yourself. But you need to do more than enjoy the message. It needs to bring you to Jesus. I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray in just a few moments. It's not just simply to get you out of the place where you are and bring you up here. It's to bring you to Jesus. Here's your practical experience or application in Scripture. In John 12, 21, the Greeks were seeking Jesus and came to Philip. The same came, therefore, to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee and desired him saying, sir, we would see Jesus. Would to God that every individual in this building had come here today for that one purpose. And it's my job as the Philip or the disciple of Jesus Christ to bring you to him. And that's all Philip did is to get his name recorded in scripture other than to be chosen to be one of the apostles is he was uh, chosen and he, he simply brought them to Jesus. And that's what we're here to do. Here's your, here's your theological doctrinal statement in Galatians 3.24. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster. For what reason? To bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. That's why you're here, is because the law taught us, trained us, showed us. We can't do this without Jesus in our life. We're, we're going we're gonna to be totally defeated and destroyed in our own flesh because we can't do it. But what's the spiritual experience? 2 Corinthians 3, 6 tells you exactly. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. How many of you are thankful for the Holy Ghost? That's why we still believe in Acts 2, 38 and Acts 2, 1 through 4. And we want you to receive the Holy Ghost because it's the Holy Ghost that will tell you about Jesus. It will glorify Jesus in your life. 
but the letter killeth. And so the type and shadow is always a type and shadow at the golden calf when they sinned after Moses had come down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments. There were 3,000 slain by the tribe of Levi. But on the day of Pentecost, there were 3,000 made alive. <laughs> after the outpouring, the initial outpouring of the Holy Ghost in Acts 2, 1 through 4, that day, 3,000 were added to the church. The type and shadow is the law killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. That's why I want you to live. I don't want you to die. I don't want you to feel like life's not worth living. I want you to get something that'll let you know life is worth living. Sir, we would see Jesus. God bless you. You may be seated. The law was given and was very austere in its rules and regulations. A fourth century rabbi identified 613 mitzvahs, as the Jewish people would call them, or laws contained within the Torah. Now, depending on how you divide that up, you could perhaps realistically come up with more than that, but he was the one that condensed it and put it together that there were 613 mitzvahs. But God knew that the law in itself was insufficient to save man's souls. That just simply the letter alone would kill, but the spirit would give life. Therefore, when men came to God in the Old Testament, the Lord provided seven amendments to the law. He gave seven amendments that he would allow men to come to him in certain ways that would establish the fact that there needs to be a new testament. You need a new covenant. This old covenant that was made with Moses is insufficient and incapable of saving your soul. Now, Jesus didn't do away with the law, but he completed the law and he fulfilled it for our benefit and for our blessing. And the, sev the first amendment to that law was when Moses, Moses, all he saw of God was judgment. All he saw of God was slaying people because they couldn't obey the law. I mean, everything, everywhere he turned, it was darkness and judgment. And he, you can't let them come up. You got to set boundaries. If they come up, then I'm going to knock them out and then, you know, bump them off. And, and that was all he saw until finally in Exodus 34, he cries out, show me thy glory. He looked for the glory of God in all of the things that he was doing in the judgment against Egypt, bringing them out, bringing them to Sinai. Where's your glory? I don't see your glory. And then God did something magnificent that was totally different than what he had provided Moses earlier and up to this point. He provided an amendment and said, I want to show you my glory. So he placed him in a, in, on a rock and he said, I'm going to hide my face from you, but you're going to see my hinder parts. And he gives 13 principles of God's goodness. And the Lord descended in a cloud. He stood with him there and proclaimed the name. The glory of God is in his name. When you can find his name, you find his glory. He said he's merciful, he's gracious, he's long-suffering, he's abundant in goodness and truth, uh, keeping mercies for thousands and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. There wasn't any of this in the law until Moses cried out, show me thy glory. I know we're looking at a very bleak world around us. There's a lot of uncertainty in our world, a lot of fear. But my heart still cries. I don't want to look at all of the darkness that is around me. Is there any glory in my Jesus that I might see? And it was David who picked up the theme and said, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And even in the New Testament, if you go to Ephesians 1 and 8, it'll tell you to the praise of the glory of his grace that we would be accepted in the beloved. Now just think about that for just a moment. The glory's in the grace. The glory's not in your judgmental spirit. 
The glory is not in your critical attitude. Mm. The glory is not in, oh, I'm wounded, so therefore I am excused from doing right. Because somebody hurt me, now I can go do whatever I want to do. Everybody that's ever walked with God, there's going to be a place somewhere where the enemy is going to try to take you out. You're going to get hurt. You're going to get wounded. But I serve a God who is a healer. And he is a heart mender. And the glory is in the grace. When you can become gracious like my Jesus and adopt his nature and his identity, that's when the glory is going to come into this place. The glory doesn't come in here because we're austere and because we're unbending and we're unyielding in our resolve to do whatever it is we think we're supposed to do. But when it's grace and mercy and you can be forgiven in this house and you can find a new start in this place, there's a new beginning. My God amended the law so he could build a new testament that said my my glory is in my name and my glory is in my grace not only can you be forgiven but you can be accepted in the beloved that means I've got a seat at the table you can't deny me access to the authority and the glory of God because I've been given a new nature and a new name I've been born again of the water and of the spirit. You can't deny me access. Well, I don't like you. I don't like the way you comb your hair. There's something about you that's wrong. There's something about all of us that's wrong. Let me just help you right now. There's something that's dysfunctional about every individual in this building. But the glory is not in your critical spirit. The glory is in the grace. That's why I sing this because I've got grace. When the law was written by Moses, there was no allowance for any daughter to be or to receive an inheritance in Israel. It was only given to the men. The firstborn male received the inheritance until the daughters of Zelophehad decided that we don't have any male. We don't have any male descendants. There are no brothers in the house, only sisters. So what are we going to do? We don't want to lose our inheritance. So what are we going to do, Moses? They come to Moses. Moses goes to God. God amends the law. Wow. And puts the inheritance in the hands of the daughters as well as the sons. If there are no sons, then it goes to the daughters so that they do not lose their inheritance. Joel picks this up, chapter 2, read it for yourself, and says, both sons and daughters shall prophesy. And then in the Holy Ghost, when it was being poured out on the day of Pentecost, Simon Peter picks up the same thing and repeats Joel's prophecy and says, in the last days, say of God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And then in the New Testament, my, 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 he picks it up again and says that the the women and the men shall inherit alike in the kingdom of God so that there is no difference between male or female. That means, ladies, you're accepted here. Praise God. Come on in. Hallelujah. It's not just for the brothers. It's for all the sisters as well because God amended his own law. Somebody better say amen because the inheritance is in the house. Woo! Hallelujah. When God established the law, he established the judgment that would come upon anybody who, who killed another person. That it would be eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand. There's no way out. You're going to die. That's just all there is to it. Flat out. Until somebody came to Moses, brought it to his attention, and said, now Moses, what are we going to do if they accidentally kill somebody? What are we going to do now? Because they didn't really have any hate in their heart. It was an accident, but they're still dead. And the avenger of the blood's coming after them. And what are we going to do? And then the Lord said, I want you to pick out six cities of refuge. And I want you to make the way, prepare the way. Let the elders hear the case. If the elders decide that it was accidental, they get to stay there to the death of the high priest. Woo! Ha <laughs> ha. 
My God, when I came to church here, I didn't just come to see who was here and what you were wearing. I came to my refuge. He said the slayer might flee, that he might live. So you got to prepare the way and mark it and make sure that the sign is up and running and there are no stones in the way. You've got to put all of your resources into making sure that he who is running from the avenger of blood has a way to their refuge. You say, well, where's our refuge in the New Testament? Is there, a, is there a sister scripture? Is there companion scripture? Hebrews 6.18 says that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. David picks it up in prophetic theme in Psalms 57 and 1 and says, Be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful, for my soul trusteth in thee, yea. In the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah. The Bible says, if any man is sick among you, call for the elders of the church and let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And if you've committed any sins, it shall be forgiven you. The reason why we preach healing in this place is because if God heals you, he has forgiven you. And if he forgives you, he can heal you. So we still preach it and we still believe it just exactly like we preach it. Because when I walked in here, I didn't walk into a place of judgment. The high priest is still alive, and you can't judge me because this place is a refuge. Hallelujah. Maybe I'm not all that in a bag of tater chips, but God's not finished with me yet. So you get over your pride. You walk up in here and start praising the Lord. You say, but so-and-so's in this place and they're a hypocrite. I don't care what they are. They came to the refuge. And as long as the high priest is still alive. And the Bible says he ever liveth to make intercession for us. I've got an amendment to the law. That gives me a refuge. So I can clap my hands, worship and praise the Lord. Here's your next amendment. The ark had been taken by the Philistines. They had no place to come to where the glory of God rested. It was in the land of Philistia until David decided to bring the ark home to him. At first, Uzzah touched the ark as it was being drawn on a cart of oxen. And God couldn't accept that particular method, so he killed Uzzah at the threshing floor. And then when David purchased that threshing floor, and he purchased this threshing floor when he sinned against God by numbering Israel, he purchased the place in order for him to put the temple mount. But the Bible says specifically the tabernacle was still at Gibeon. But David pitched a tent. Hmm. He had authority and prophetic word. That tent had no veil. It was at Gibeon. And it stayed at Gibeon until Solomon's temple was built. But David set up a tabernacle and put the ark in the tent. Appointed singers and choirs, Jeduth and Hethan and Asaph, were a part of the leadership of the choir directors of the choirs and said, we're going to sing. And you could hear them sing from 20 miles away, Josephus said. While you were coming up to Jerusalem, you could hear down through the valleys and down along the mountains the echoes of the songs of Zion. And they were singing and praising God with harps and all kinds of instruments that David made. Woo! Hallelujah. And Gentile and and Jew together worship before the tabernacle and the glory of the Lord shined out of Mount Zion without judgment. So you can walk in here and feel all the glory of God and not fear you're going to be slain because you're an unclean person. Because he who is unclean can be made clean by the blood of the Lamb. (laughs) 
you don't believe it's true? Amos 9 and 11 says, in that day, it's referring to this day of the dispensation of grace, I will raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen and close up the breaches thereof. Then James, with his wisdom, stood up among the elders in Acts chapter 15 and said, after this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof. And guess what? The residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. God's going to do it. You say, but I'm not special, Brother Kinsey. I've messed up my life. My life, I'm just nothing. I'm nothing. I'm, I don't have anything. I'm going to tell you that you're in the tabernacle of David. My God has raised it up again. You don't have to have a social strata. You don't have to have a name. You don't have to be born to a pedigree. You don't have to have any spirituality whatsoever in your life. You just have to run to the refuge and come and listen to the songs. Most of the songs in Psalms were prophetic words that were given supernaturally to the choir director's own site at David's tabernacle, and David set up recorders, and they recorded what they were saying so that they could put it into the scripture, and it would become our hope. That's when the song was written, my God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? I don't know if that was the tune they used. But Jesus sang that song on the cross. That was not a statement. That was a song. And Jesus started singing on the cross. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, if Jesus can sing on the cross, you don't have to sit there and let the devil beat you down because of your sin. You say, well, I'm going through something. I can't worship God. I say, woo, ha, satamayara. The law states that you got to come to the tabernacle to worship. The law states it in plain English, black and white, no mistaking it. But Solomon amended the law and gave us seven scenarios. If Israel is out in a far country and they can't come to church and they're out and they're in captivity and they're in famine, and the judgment of the Lord is on them. If they turn to this place, wherever they might be, I will hear them. Will you hear them? Will you receive their prayer and forgive them? Woo, hallelujah. And then he wrote that magnificent statement. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face. There was no provision in the law for this. But in Solomon's seven scenarios, God amended the law. I don't care if you're in the darkest dungeon and you are in the most pit of despair. If you will turn toward Jesus and look unto him wherever you might be in the depths of the sea, I believe by God. Woo! I tell you what, I'm so excited. See, I know what I'm going to say next, and you don't. But I, I am so excited about telling somebody that my God has already anticipated every single excuse you could possibly make for not coming to Jesus today, and he has eliminated by making amendments to his own law. At that time, in Solomon's Scenarios. He created what you call in the Hebrew the Shamayim. The Shamayim is the divine assembly that when God's people gather, God will be in the midst of them. He set it up. Woo! And then Jesus took it. They said there had to be 10 men according to their ruling. But Jesus narrowed it down to where two or three are gathered in my name. And you will create the Shamayim, hallelujah. And I will be in the midst of them.
You say, Brother Kinsey, I'm not comfortable in the Pentecostal church. Don't matter. If you came in the name of the Lord, and I come in the name of the Lord, in this place is the Shamayim, and we are the divine assembly of God. Turn to your neighbor and say, God, all up in this house. I said, God, all up in this house. Now, I came to you in the name of the Lord. Now, I just want to know. I, I mean, you know, just for the sake of Jesus' statement, just for the amendment of the law that amended by grace that you could join with one other person and God would be in the midst. Do I have one person? Do I have one person who will stand up and say, I too have come in the name of the Lord automatically. It's not you got to pump up the music automatically. God said, I will be in the midst of them. Y'all can be seated. I'm not done yet. I know that's why you all stood and said, oh, maybe he'll be finished if we all stand. <laughs> Somebody say, this is good stuff. <laughs> Here's the next amendment to the law that had to be made. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Isaiah made their amendment to the law because the law states very plainly that you have to read the Ten Commandments and you have to obey the commandments and those commandments are as rules that if you disobey them you will die that's the law it's flat out no provision no amendment of grace until Jeremiah Joel Ezekiel and Isaiah said I'm going to create a new testament and a new law in Israel I'm going to amend the old law, and I'm going to create a new law. And we will not write the word upon tablets of stone. Because following a rule out of a rule book does not qualify you for salvation in God's eyes. Well, I go to church. That, didn't, that don't mean beans to God. But he said, I will put a new spirit. I will write a new law in their hearts. Woo, my, my, my. I think I'm going to have to shout on my own sermon. It's just so exciting. Because some of you are thinking there's no way I can live a Pentecostal lifestyle. Ain't nobody can live a Pentecostal lifestyle. Not even me. There's no way I can do the Sermon on the Mount. I get three verses in and I'm lost. <laughs> three verses into the Sermon on the Mount and I'm already repenting and saying, God, there ain't no way to go any further. You might get one out of all of them, but you ain't going to get all of them. I don't care who you are. You're not that good. You're not that and you're just a taco short of a platter. Every one of you is a taco short. According to my Bible, everybody has sinned and come short of the glory of God, and none of us got a right to nothing. But I've got an amendment to the law. Woo! And the book of Corinthians said, I will put my spirit in their heart, and they will do my statutes. Woo! We are... We are our own epistle. You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. I'm telling you, I've got the Holy Ghost. I don't need a rule book. I've got something in my heart that says I want to serve the Lord. Now, would you please, if you're in this place and you're standing and worshiping, and you may do so anytime you so choose, I love you, and I'm so glad you're here. Hallelujah. Amen. But I want you to know and understand that if you feel like you have to do that, 
in order to gain my approval to make heaven so I don't fuss at you tonight <laughs> for not doing it. Please sit down and don't ever stand up again because that is not true. You don't, I don't, I, you don't need my approval. I'm not going to fuss at you tonight if you just sit there and look at me because I'm so excited. I'll preach it anyway. Woo! Hallelujah! Why? Because I got an amendment to the law and there ain't nothing you can do to stop me from getting into his presence because I'm standing on the new covenant and the new law and the Shamayim is in the house. The divine assembly, the heavenlies, where God dwells is in this place and I've got a new law. You know, everybody gets messed up with Joel chapter 2 and verse 32 because it says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. All right, well, then Peter picks that up in, the, in his magnificent sermon on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, 21, and says, this shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Paul says the same thing in Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And everybody thinks that's a method to be saved has nothing to do with the method. That's not the means and the method you use to be saved. You say, well, what is it saying? That means everybody, Gentile. He was dealing basically with the Jewish prejudice and the wall of partition between the Jew and the Gentile because the Jews thought the Gentiles were dogs. So whenever me and brother uh, Sam Emery get together, he calls me dog. Hey, dog. And I was going to pop him one and just bust him right upside the head with the five-fold ministry. And then I found out it's scriptural. <laughs> I'm a Gentile and I'm a dog. <laughs> so what do you do with the brother that just quotes the scripture on you? There's nothing you can do with that, brother. You just go ahead and absorb. Hey, dog, I just say it back. Hey, dog, what's going on? Now, I don't say that to nobody else. Sam says it to everybody, but I don't say it to nobody else because I'm not calling anybody a dog. But the Bible did say that the Jewish people thought you were dogs. Huh? But God made a provision in David's tabernacle, in the Shamayim, that both the Gentile and the Jew, I don't care how messed up you are. I don't care if you're the worst sinner that's ever been created in Pensacola or the world. You came to a place of refuge. There will be no judgment here as long as the high priest has got breath. There's power. I proclaim the name of the Lord. I said, I proclaim the name of the Lord. His glory is in his grace. And if the glory of the Lord is here, there's grace. There's a refuge from the storm. Okay, one last, one last refuge. I'm going to please all the melancholies today. Seventh amendment to the law. The law states plain as day. Deuteronomy 6, 16. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. Plain and simple. You can't do it. Malachi amends the law and says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there might be meat in my house and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven. He establishes a new law. It's called the law of giving. The New Testament says the Lord loveth a cheerful giver. That when you come before him and you make your petitions, you do it with thanks. Three of you went to Sunday school. You do it with thanks. Thanksgiving. If you will not forgive, uh, you didn't really pay attention. You went to Sunday school, but you didn't pay attention. If you do not forgive, you shall not be for. All right, there you go. You got it. You did go to Sunday school. Thank the Lord. Without giving, you got to have a giving heart. 
say, I don't have anything to give. There's no money. I have no prestige. I have no, nothing to give. Yes, you do. Woo, hallelujah. Man, I feel this in my soul. He changed the law and amended it so that you could give yourself. Romans says it right. Present yourself a living sacrifice. Woo! Give yourself. I have nothing but me, and that's all he wants is you. He don't want your mama. He don't want your daddy. He wants you. And when your mama comes, he just wants her. He wants you to give yourself. Sir, we would see Jesus. Everybody stand. And so here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask somebody to give themselves to Jesus. Say, well, I've repented. I've, I believe in Jesus, but I haven't received the Holy Ghost since I believed and I haven't spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gives me the utterance. I invite you today to walk to the front and meet me up here. I'm right here. So you know just to step out from where you stand and walk down that aisle. Come right up here. Meet me up here. Here I am. Come. Bring yourself to Jesus. I have nothing to give. He understood that from the beginning. That's why the law was written is to reveal your nothingness to yourself. You can't keep the laws of God. 613 of them. There's no way. It's impossible. You can't do it. You can't, you can't fulfill the Sermon on the Mount. All that sounds really good, turning the other cheek, going the second mile. Don't complain if your wages aren't enough. Just be content with whatever you have. <laughs> That'll kill all of us here. Every one of you dead. Well, they ought to be paying me more than what they're paying me. I have to go through this and that and the other. And I'm not saying you don't. I'm just saying that's what the book says. He said, blessed are the meek. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the merciful. <laughs> Try that on. Just, just get into the Beatitudes and see if you don't get a conviction all over your spirit. I'm talking about people that have the Holy Ghost all their life. Just get in the Beatitudes and see if any of that fits you. If you got half of it, it's a miracle. And we keep trying. Yeah, of course. Aren't you glad you got a refuge? Don't try to bring your righteousness. It's nothing but filthy rags. Bring yourself. Just yourself, as you are, come to Jesus. Step out from wherever you might be in the balcony, in the back. It does not matter. I want you to present yourself to Jesus Christ, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him. Come, bring yourself to Jesus. You want the Holy Ghost? You need a miracle? Step out from where you're at, sir, ma'am. Step out from where you're at. You want the anointing and the blessing of the Lord to come upon you? Step out from where you're at. Walk up here and let Jesus change your life forever. Come, come, come and join me up here at the front. And walk up here and say, I want my Jesus in my heart. I want him in my life to change me to become what he wants me to be. Come. Come, present yourself to the Lord. Come, give yourself to Jesus Christ. Give yourself completely and totally to him. From all over this building, every one of you that hear the call of God crying out to you right now, walk up here, walk up here, walk up here. Just present yourself. Just see what he'll do for you. See what he'll do for you. See, see how he will help you, how he will change you how you, he will save you. 
how he will heal you. You see, God understood from the beginning it was not like a second thought to him. It was not like he had to go back and say, you know what, I don't think I made this complete enough. He knew what he was doing when he allowed the law to be spoken. He wanted man's input. He wanted men to come cry out to him and say, Lord, your law is too austere and I can't live it. I can't do it. And then he amends it and puts grace and puts refuge and puts inheritance for the daughters as well as the sons. Gives you hope, gives you a brighter future. Come. The law of giving is still in operation in the New Testament dispensation of grace where you can give yourself to him. He'll break every single chain on your life. There will be nothing holding you captive any longer. Walk up here and let him release you from that chain and deliver you from that chain and be delivered by the power of God. Walk up here. I'm still standing here waiting for you to accept what Jesus said he would do for you. And if you brought someone with you that you know needs God desperately, I want you to whisper in their ear and say, I'll go with you. I know this kind of a crowd is very intimidating. I get all of that. Got a lot of people here. It's hard to do that. But look at all these wonderful people standing here needing Jesus in their heart, needing Jesus to meet a need that they have in the kingdom or just to be changed and want to partake of his nature so we can bear the identity of Christ and be all that God wants us to be. Why don't you come? That's it. Bring yourself. Your offering is yourself. Bring your thanksgiving. Bring your forgiving. Bring your giving to Jesus. And give of yourself to him. Give of yourself to him. Oh yes, come, come, come. Step out by faith. Walk up here and let Jesus minister grace to you. Walk up here and let Jesus minister grace to you. Saints of God, what I would like for you to do is I'd like for you to come and stand with these precious people that are in need of a touch from God. They might be young people, they might be children, they might be others that are here that need a touch from God. People I don't even know are seeking after the Lord here this morning. It's a beautiful thing and we're gonna pray a prayer of repentance. We're gonna believe that God is gonna hear us when we cry out unto him. Why don't you walk up here? Then we're gonna pray a prayer of faith and the Holy Ghost is is gonna come in among us because you saw how many people came in the name of the Lord. The Shamayim is in the house. The divine assembly. God has set up court right here. Step out by faith. Thank God for the amendments that made provision. For when I can't do and be all that I'm supposed to be, at least I have a refuge to run to. I have a place to go. Hallelujah. I want you to lift your hands right now all over this building. And I want you to repent and ask God to forgive you. Father, I thank you for your magnificent love. I thank you for your wonderful peace. I thank you for your wonderful love for all of us. Lord, I ask that the Spirit of God would come upon us. Let the Holy Ghost forgive us, Lord, of our sin. That's it. That's it right now. Forgive. Forgive. If you've got all in your heart, forgive that person. You say, well, I don't know if I can do that. Just put it on the altar. Let's just give it to God. That's how you do that. He'll take it from there. 
You can't do this. You can't forgive some people of the craziness they've done to you in the past. God's got to help you do that. Give it to Him. You can't do that by yourself. I can't do it by myself, and I've been serving God all my life. But I give it to the one who can do something about it, and His name is Jesus. That's it. I feel a Holy Ghost coming in this place right now. Now let's pray the prayer of faith. Lift your hands by faith in the name of Jesus. I proclaim the name over this congregation and this altar. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Receive the blessing of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.